I'd like to welcome you to our inaugural online marketing club event on the latest trends in digital marketing. The marketing club was created primarily to help students get the most from their graduate gateway accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. This club event is one of three or four online events we plan to run this academic year. Other dates will be announced shortly. Of course, CI members and other marketing practices are welcome to attend as well as students. As you can appreciate right now, the club exists online only, but when things return to normal, we hope to provide networking opportunities for students, marketing practitioners and CIM course directors. For the uninitiated, the CIM Graduate Gateway program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions Graduate Gateway provides. So if you're a student, you can sign up to receive the Graduate Gateway newsletter. Each edition will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. We'll send you a link and the QR code to the sign up page after today's event. OK, before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 45 minutes, followed by a short 10 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the Ask a Question chat box in the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen if watching on a laptop or across the top if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we are using the hashtag CIM events. The webinar has been recorded and we will share a link to the recording with you over the next few days. You'll also be emailed a short feedback survey after the event which we'd love you to complete. It'll only take a few minutes. All survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. OK, I'd now like to hand over to Daniel Rouse, who is our guest speaker today. Thanks very much indeed. Welcome everyone uh, to this latest trends in digital marketing session. My name is Daniel Rouse, as has been said, and I will just start by introducing myself. So I am CEO of a company called Target Internet, and we work with lots of global brands, helping them to upskill their teams, uh, and to get their digital marketing right. Um, I'm also a course director and a fellow for the Chartered Institute of Marketing, meaning I teach on behalf of the Chartered Institute, and I'm CEO of a company called the Digital Leadership Programme, and we are creating mini alternatives to university programmes. Obviously, put any questions you've got into the chat uh, and the question box, as was said, but if you want to say anything nice or nasty during the presentation, it's Daniel Rolls on Twitter, and it's Target Internet on Instagram, and I will get back to every single comment. So if you want to say anything on there, please do so. And I'll be very happy to follow up afterwards, but I'll give you my contact details at the end of the session so you can get in contact directly as well. These are some of the brands that I'm working with uh, on a day by day basis. So you'll know the Googles, Apples and uh, Tesco's and Vodafone's of the world and, and lots of others uh, in there as well. Um, I am a programme director at Imperial College Business School. So I head up uh, the, you know, the digital marketing programmes and a lot of the digital transformation programs as well. And some of them, my lovely students there that haven't stood that close to each other in an awfully long time, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with. And I do something called the Digital Marketing Podcast. And I love to show this image because it is a global top 50, top 100 uh, podcast. And the point I want to make out is that our Digital Marketing Podcast is sitting there next to Reed Hoffman's podcast. Reed started LinkedIn, uh, is involved in PayPal. You've got Financial Times on the same page, BBC Radio 4. And the point I'm saying is not I'm showing off, but to say that podcast costs almost nothing to produce. Yet it's a top 50 podcast. And a lot of the principles we're going to talk about today will tell you how you can do that. Because the reality is, with all the latest trends and tech I'm going to talk about, what it's really about is getting back to fundamentals and thinking about our target audience. And that's what this does. What's the target audience? It's marketers, it's students, it's business owners. What do they want to do? They want to stay up to date with digital marketing. Therefore, this does what they want it to do, uh, and therefore it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy for us to get that audience because we're giving people what they really need. I've also written a few books on the topic, and the only reason I mention this is not because I'm going to try and flog you a book. But the whole point is it's to try and demonstrate I actually know what I'm talking about. So if you believe books tell you that, then you can see that as well. But let's really start with the problem. This is a little screen recording from a website called Internet Live Stats. And what this is showing us is how much content has been created so far today. And if you've been on any of my presentations before, I love to show this and it's just been updated. 
and you can see it's up at about 4 million blog posts now. It'd be up to 5 million by the end of the day. If you want anyone to look at the stuff that you're actually creating, it is getting increasingly hard. More videos over on the left hand side of the screen watched uh, than searches done in Google, but that's massively misleading because that's people starting videos. It's not people actually watching them through. The average view duration is actually about two and a half seconds with people going, no, no, no. And the average video only actually gets about four views. And that's normally by the person that uploaded the video. The biggest number on here is the number of emails that have been sent so far today, which is why email marketing is getting harder and harder as well. So the reality is we are in this noisy environment. It is getting harder and harder. So therefore, we're going to need to really get things right to stand out in all of this. The other thing we've got as well as noise is constant change. This is the desktop version of TikTok, and I'm guessing a few of you didn't know this even existed. But in reality, uh, just like with Instagram, they've created this kind of desktop version, just like with Instagram, no one's using it. But when I talk about constant change, the reality is if I'd looked at TikTok adoption in the UK pre lockdown, it was very low. And if I spoke to a load of my 21 year old students and said, are you on TikTok? They would have went, no, nah, that's for kids. So the average age demographic in the UK of TikTok was a lot lower than it was around the world. Um, the reason TikTok is growing so quickly, by the way, is because it's so big all around the world. So it's big in China, big in the US and so on. And that's very unusual because if you're familiar uh, with the Chinese market, generally the Chinese market have their own platforms um, that aren't really used around the world as well. So lots of noise and constant change. And to put that, that kind of trend in perspective, let's do a quick quiz. So what I'm going to do is on the right hand side of the screen here, um, I brought up some stuff from uh, Google Internet Stats. This is where Google piled together some stats they believe to be true. And I put a load of stats on the right hand side of the screen that are correct and lots of incorrect ones. And then I've taken a load of statements and I've covered up the key bit of the answer. And all I want you to do is as we go along, if you've got a piece of paper with you or you want to jot it down on your phone. I want you to try and guess what the correct answer is based on. You have to guess one of the ones on the right hand side of the screen. Now, before we get into this, I should tell you the average person gets one right. So if you get one right, you're doing brilliantly. It is Thursday evening and you're, you're nice and average. If you get less than one, i.e. zero, um, we'll forgive it. It's Thursday evening. If you get more than one, you're above average on a Thursday evening and we're all winning. So the amount of video uploaded to YouTube every day as a duration of time. Have a look on the right hand side of the screen. You've got eight hours, 20 years that you've got a five years in there uh, and so on. So pick one of those durations of time. Um, how much video do you think is actually up those YouTube every day? Now, if you've seen my presentation before, you'll notice the number I used to show you has gone. And actually now we are at a rather ridiculous 65 years of content being uploaded to YouTube every day, which means if you want anyone to watch your video, it is getting increasingly hard. A moment ago, we spoke about mobile devices. What percentage of all web traffic is actually now on a mobile device? So pick one of those percentages. Well, interestingly, it's normally lower than people think, and it's actually at 52%. So it is just about the majority. Now, that's really important, though, because then Google say everything should be a mobile first uh, way of thinking about your digital marketing in the fact that, for example, they have mobile first indexing. What does that mean? It basically means they're looking at the mobile version of your website to decide what shows up even when someone searches on a desktop. If your mobile website's terrible, that's not a good thing. Therefore, if it's 52% of traffic, well, therefore mobile accounts for what percentage of e-commerce? You think it would be about the same. Uh, but in reality, it's actually up at 70%. So it's massively important we get this right. But the reality is very often we look at our mobile websites and say, oh, it's a bit slow. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that and I'm going to talk about some massive shifts within Google towards this as well. Uh, percentage of people globally that listen to podcasts regularly, huge growth in this area. Have a look at what those percentages, have a little guess where you think it might be. If I'd looked at this in the UK, for example, two years ago, it was about 20, 25 percent. Since then, it's grown up to about 43 percent of people listening. It's about 42 percent in the UK, incidentally. A huge growth, massively important channel, uh, really interesting channel that I'll talk about at the moment. And you might think there's loads of podcasts out there. My podcast is never going to cut through. In reality, there are lots of American podcasts. There aren't so many podcasts in different regions around the world. So definitely worth thinking about if there's a, a hole in the market. There. Twitter's got 320 million active users. That isn't going down. It's actually gone up 3% in the last year. Where's Instagram? And WeChat, you might not be familiar, WeChat is a big platform in the Chinese market. 
Uh, well, actually, Instagram is now at about a billion users and WeChat is about 1.2 billion users. But don't discount Twitter. Don't discount Facebook, in fact. The reality is there are huge amounts of people still using these platforms really actively. It depends on your target audience, and the demographic of the people you're speaking to. If I am aiming at 45 year old plus people, I'm probably not going to get to them um, via Snapchat or via TikTok. A lot of those people have got accounts, but they're not using them regularly. Uh, now, based on that 320 million active users on Twitter every month, how many tweets do we think there might be every day? Well, you might say if each of those people does three tweets each, that's up to a billion almost already. It's got to be a huge number. Uh, in reality, it's only about 500 million tweets every day. We say only 500, it's half a billion tweets a day. But most people on Twitter never tweet. So we've got huge volumes of content. Mobile is important, but we're not necessarily doing a great job of it. Our channel adoption is shifting very, very quickly, and we need to understand the differences in demographics and in locations to really understand our target audience. If you got one, I'm very happy for your average. If you got more than one correct, and I was going pretty quickly, congratulations, uh, you're above average tonight. And if you got zero, don't worry, the people that got more than one made up for us. So that's OK, we won't worry about it too much. But we've got some trends behind this we need to look at. So what I want to try and do is give you a really practical guide over the next 40 minutes or so. What's really going to change? Uh, and these are rather than being predictions, a lot of them are we've seen the shift already and we can start to see it accelerating. One or two are predictions and I'll, I'll explain those um, and, and others guaranteed. And, and this is one of the guaranteed ones. Now, every single one of the tools and the websites that I mentioned are in a toolkit. So if you stay on the presentation at the end, you will get signposted to that toolkit. So that's my way of keeping you on the presentation and keeping your attention as we, as we go through things. Right, you've probably been on a website like this. So when I was doing research, I've been doing lots of presentations for digital trends for 2021 recently. And I searched this website and it says, top 10 digital marketing trends for 2020, you need to know. That sounds like the right stuff for me. And I go through to the website and I get on the right hand side, um, a load of recent posts, which is fine. And then they get a pop up that says chat uh, with Economobile Vietnam, okay? So bearing the fact I'm not in Vietnam, that's not that useful to me. So I'm probably going to ignore that. By the way, 97% of us, when we see a chat bot, it says, how can I help? I think you probably can't uh, and we ignore them. Um, there is a whole industry growing around making them better, which I'll talk about in a moment. So one, I've got a chat bot, it's a bit interrupted, but it's not over the content, so I don't mind. But then I've got this big thing that pops up and says, sign up now, get a free trial, get this great stuff. It's going to be fantastic. And it gets in the way of what I'm reading. We find this irritating. They can work, but Google doesn't like them. Now, Google changed their algorithm all the time. They're constantly changing the set of rules that decides what shows up and wasn't, doesn't show up in the search results. But they have been, normally they would give us a month or two notice on a big update, but they've done something this year they've never done before. And they've said there is an update coming next year and it's really important and, and you need to take notice of it. And one of the things that's, that's going to be part of this is this interruptive over the top of what you're reading pop ups are going to be seen as negative. And if you have a lot of these, you will not show up in the search results. So being a lot more careful of how we're going about doing this. So um, just to give you an example of this in practice, I'm going to jump into my browser and I am going to search in here how to get Google Analytics certification. Right, so um, I've got Google Academy number one and then my website's showing up number two, so that's very nice, so I can click through to that. And there we go, we've got a blog post that answers the question. I'll talk about that in a moment. Then on the right hand side, this thing pops up and says, future proof your digital marketing, that's all great. Um, not over the top of the content. Then I get to the bottom and it says, the rapid waging good, you need to keep up to date. That's not interruptive either. Now I put the next one in place for a demonstration, I wouldn't normally do this. As I leave the page, it then says, don't go. You need to come and look at our stuff. That is interrupted. So the first two are fine, they're not getting in my way, but this one is actually a pain. So there's a bit of a fine line, but it seems pretty obvious actually that if you're doing things to get in people's way, Google is going to punish you. So take a look at your brands and take a look at other brands and, and kind of see what they're doing. Now, th this is taken from Google Trends. And Google Trends is one of my favorite websites. I'm sure most of you have looked at Google Trends at one point or another. If you haven't, you're missing out. Google Trends allows you to see trends in search over time. So I can go in and search for a phrase and it will tell me how it's changing. Um, and 
just to put this into kind of live perspective, let's go through to trends now. And I'm going to put a phrase in. I'm going to put the word jobs in. I'm going to open it up not just to be UK. I'm going to go global and I go back to 2004 till future. Right, this is the seasonal trend. People searching the word jobs. There is a spike every January because people come back in January of New Year's resolutions. That's it. I'm getting a new job. Then they go back to work. Uh, and if I point to the graph here, you kind of see they get back to work and they realize well, I'm really busy. Uh, I'll worry about that next year. I'll worry about that later in the year. Then they go on their summer holidays and they think oh, I really am going to change my life. And then they realize it's Christmas just around the corner and they think ah, do it next year. And the same thing happens year in, year out. There's a big spike in 2009 because the financial crisis. You can see big kind of shifts during the whole period of lockdown and furlough and so on as well here. But huge spike in the middle. What's going on there? Steve Jobs died and it skews the data because people are searching his name jobs, not as in jobs recruitment. And I can kind of prove that by comparing the word jobs to the word job because there is no spike there because it was Steve Jobs, not Steve Jobs. So it's a lovely tool. You can do all sorts of kind of fun things with it. I won't spend too much time laboring the point, but what's going on on the screen here? There's a huge spike in whatever this is. Uh, what's the search for? Trampolines. So during lockdown, people stuck at home. Uh, maybe for themselves, maybe if their kids thought a trampoline will leave some boredom. So it was a good time to be in the trampoline business. My point of showing you this is there are opportunities in search at all times. When something goes wrong, when something goes right, when there's a trend, when there's a shift, and we can identify business opportunities with these tools. Now, the this, this top of the spike, it shows 100, and that's basically the highest point on the chart. So it's relative volume. So different search terms will show at different levels. It doesn't tell you the actual number of searches. Um, there are other tools that can kind of do that. If you're looking for one of those, have a look at keywords everywhere. All of these are in the toolkit that I'm going to share with you, so you can take a look at those. But Google Trends is shifting search behavior. What happened during the initial lockdown? Search volume dropped by 20%. People are on social media more. Then it's gone up and people are searching about 15% more now than they were before. They are searching for things like online courses, 20 or 30% more than they were. So you can start to understand the impact that people's environment and circumstances is having on their search behavior. So important that we kind of keep up to date with that. Now, as part of this, podcasting shifted. 90% of our podcast listeners listened when they were traveling. And that all stopped. Um, basically, the people weren't traveling anymore. So we were, yeah, you know, we saw our numbers drop down a little bit. But now what's happening is it's actually gone up about 15, 20% against where it was at its peak. If people are sitting at home, they're in the office at home, they can put stuff on their computer, maybe not annoy people around them, or they've got some earphones in, or they're walking the dog. Uh, they're going out to do some sort of exercise and they'll listen to podcasts. But also, Spotify is recommending podcasts. Apple have got their own podcast app, and Google are, in fact, recommending podcasts within the search results. So I've searched for a digital marketing podcast here. You can see we've got our lovely yellow logo there um, in the top row. We've got our website showing number one. Then we've got two of our actual podcasts showing up in the search results. Now, bear in mind what I said, this podcast costs very little to produce. It's two people chatting. So it's me and Kira, my marketing director, chatting for about 30 minutes about digital marketing. That's it. Nothing clever, just people chatting. But it serves a purpose. If I go back to the fundamentals of marketing, who's my target audience? They're marketers, they're students. What do they want to do? They want to stay up to date with digital marketing. They want it in an easily digestible format. They want it in a format they can consume when they're doing other things. So this just ticks the box. So there's a lot of growth in this area, but Google are pushing these kind of things to the top of the search results. And if I look at this update, what's kind of shifted and where are people now? Well, 90% of us watching online videos, 53% of us watching video blogs or blogs. Uh, about 73% of us listen to streaming services, 47% radio stations, and about 43% globally podcasts. This is from a website called Data Reportal. And Data Reportal has stats on everything, and it's free. And essentially, they do updates three or four times a year, and then they do their annual updates as well. And basically, if you need to know in your region how many people use Instagram, in your region how many people listen to podcasts, Really important when you're doing that first part of a strategy. So if you're following something like Sostak, so you're doing your situational analysis at the beginning. Um, Sostak is a framework by Paul R. Smith uh, that helps you carry you through your planning. It's really good for digital. The first S is situational analysis. Well, this will give you some really good insights. 
So if you go to datareportal.com, and again, it's listed in the toolkit, you can download huge amounts of stats absolutely for free. We're also seeing a real shift in the number of ad options that are available to us. And I thought it's, it's quite interesting to lay it out like this. If the size of these kind of planets recommends or represents, sorry, the population of a particular platform, see Facebook's still the biggest, but of the next ones, WhatsApp, Messenger, WeChat uh, are all Messenger apps. Bear in mind when you look at this, that Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram are owned by the same company. Uh, if you look at WeChat, TikTok, QQ, Weibo, QZone are all from the Chinese market. So what you start to see is that lots of people are using these messaging apps. Therefore, we are seeing more and more opportunities for advertising within these kind of places as well. So at the moment, if you want to advertise in Instagram, you do it via Facebook, but also you can advertise in Messenger via Facebook. Uh, and you're going to see more of that stuff. They're actually bringing together WhatsApp Messenger and Instagram Messenger into one kind of place as well. So look out for the different ad options, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. But all of these platforms are very heavily trying to compete with Google as the place to go through for advertising. So we need to look out and keep an eye on all these kind of changes. And actually, you've got a real first lead advantage because they're bringing out new ad formats. And if you use that ad format first, it tends to grab people's attention. So you have a, a nice opportunity to test and learn by testing these new formats out. And actually, even LinkedIn are doing carousel ads now and so on. So there's some real shifts. If you notice down the far end, um, things like Twitter and LinkedIn are pretty far down, as is Snapchat and Pinterest and things like that. So really worth putting in perspective. Now, this kind of leads us nicely into content. And I'll talk about something called our skills benchmark later on. But there's, there's been a, bit, a growth in skills around content marketing, the idea of creating content to engage your audience, all the different stages of the user journey. And how, what approach are people taking? Well, this study says that about 43% of people, the majority of people were very project focused. I have built this product, therefore I'm gonna do content on that topic. That's not really aligned with the audience necessarily unless they're at the point of purchase. Personas, based on a particular audience, or even better, customer journey, where someone is in that particular stage of the user journey. In an ideal world, we would be combining personas and customer journeys to create our content. Who's my target audience? Where are they in their user journey? Therefore, what contents they want? So for example, if I go in and search for what you do, I should be able to find you. But what about if I don't even understand what you do yet? How, what kind of content would get you in the door in the first place? So I've got to understand my audience and understand the kind of questions they might be asking. So I can make sure I'm in the search results when they're looking for things. And I'll give you some really practical examples of that at the moment. What this demonstrates is most content is still not being created in the best practice way which fundamentally means that there is an opportunity to get content marketing right to do a great job of it. What we also saw is an uplift in content marketing skills this year, but that's not necessarily a good thing because that's pretty much nothing to base it, which means there is more and more low quality content going out there, which means there's more and more noise. So there is an opportunity to stand out if you can do a good job of this. Now, if any of you using Google Analytics, you may be aware of this, but there is a new version of Google Analytics, which is GA4 and they are combining the analytics for apps and web websites into the same place. We've done some early testing with this. We had a beta testing version of this for a while. You'll notice the menus on the left hand side are all different. It's the main version of analytics, lots of new stuff to learn, very little documentation at the moment, unfortunately. But in normal analytics, web analytics at the moment, if you want to track somebody playing a video or somebody downloading a PDF or somebody clicking through to an external website, you have to add extra code to your website to be able to do that. And we call these things events and we can add some event tracking code in the new version of Google Analytics. It does that automatically. It will work out. You can see people downloading files, people uh, looking at certain things, scrolling within my content, not just getting there, but actually scrolling as well and so on. So some really good advanced kind of features. Interestingly, what we're seeing, though, is that there are some disparities at the moment between Google Analytics, and the new version of Google Analytics. So if you do set this up, don't just switch off your own analytics make sure that you keep both running, which you can do to, to make sure you've got kind of track of your data a little bit until they've ironed out some of the issues uh, with some of these things as well. And it is a pretty steep learning curve. There's lots of new reports in there. So good time to start learning. There's a huge skills gap in analytics. Anyone with good analytics skills has got a great opportunity of a career because people can look at it and go and do analytics analysis. Say, I think the analytics are telling you this, there's a, there's a big opportunity. Right, everything so far has been pretty much guaranteed. This is something to keep an eye on. Um, you may or may not have seen this. This is the Oculus Quest 2. It is the new virtuality headset 
from Facebook. Three hundred dollars, actually three hundred pounds as well, uh, and pretty amazing kit. If you haven't tried one, it has brought virtual reality on uh, leaps and bounds. Doesn't need to be connected to a computer. It's a standalone thing. Got a computer built into it. You can see just on the edge of the headset, there's some little cameras. If I point them out, what that means is that they're only black and white cameras, not particularly high resolution. But when you're jumping around your room, you can draw a safe zone so that you don't bounce into a wall or fall down the stairs, whatever else it may be. It's a pretty clever. But what we're suddenly seeing is that we've got cheaper hardware, much better interactions and actually a much better experience. We've been trialing this as a training tool. So we bought 20 of these. We did a training course with a big corporate and we sh shipped them out to people. We were doing a Zoom call and then we just jumped in and said, right, put your headset on. We're all going to meet in virtual reality. Kind of gimmicky at the moment. The next step, however, is when the cameras on these things are better and it becomes augmented reality, i.e. you can see the world around you, but you can overlay things on top. We're suddenly seeing some quite interesting things like, for example, your monitor can be the size of the room, but you can still see your keyboard and everything else. You've got this kind of virtual monitor and so on as well. So pretty interesting just to go through and just to have a think about how you could potentially use these. Not saying you're going to be using them a lot yet unless you're into gaming, but in reality, something to keep an eye on that's going to shift pretty quickly. We've been predicting it will be the year of augmented and virtual reality for years, but it does feel like we're on the cusp of things at the moment. Right, another thing to think about is privacy as currency. And what do I mean by this? Well, this is the idea that in reality, people understand that I will have to give you some of my privacy. I will have to give you maybe my email address or some other details in order to kind of get something in exchange, maybe to download some content or something like that. But because as people are becoming aware of that, they're more willing to say, OK, I'll exchange you. Give me some value. I'll go through and I will give you something in exchange for that. Now, let, let me give you an example of this. If I go through. And I'm going to go to adsettings.google.com. This is what Google knows about me based on what I do on Google and based on what I do on YouTube and what I do on two and a half million other websites. What you can see here is it says, well, you are in the 45 to 50 year old age bracket. Sadly, I just moved into that. Uh, you have been on all of these websites and these are all things we reckon you've got an interest in. And there's a huge, massive list of things that they think I'm interested in. Now I could go and go, oh, I've got no interest in fishing whatsoever. So I could click on that and turn it off. But all I'm doing is helping them to improve their profile. This is what Google sell. And it's equally what Facebook sell and so on. So people are becoming more aware of that. What does that mean? Well, it means as a brand, we need to make sure that we are very clear on what data we're collecting, but also that we don't abuse this and we don't collect any data that we don't necessarily need. Because it really is going to start impacting our brands more and more, but people understand the value of their privacy and their data a little bit more. And they will give you some, but you need to give them something in exchange and you need to treat it with respect. And there's a there's a building awareness of that as well. Right, you've probably heard about uh, influencer marketing. Well, this is uh, influencer cynicism. So what I mean by this is more and more of us heard about influencer marketing. Everyone wants to be an influencer. And I can kind of demonstrate that because if I jump into Google, so I'm going to go to Google and I have a plugin for Google Chrome that tells me the volume of people searching something. So if I go um, by Instagram followers, it will tell me, which um, if I go through here, that uh, people are searching by Instagram followers cheap over on the right hand side of the page here. Uh, 12,100 searches a month by real active Instagram followers, 11,000 searches a month by Instagram followers on PayPal, 4,000 searches a month. Lots of people are trying to gain the system and trying to make out that they're influencers. What we can do is use tools like this. This is a great tool called Spark Toro, and Spark Toro will analyze a social media account. In this case, my Twitter account. And it says, right, for someone on average, has got 8,000 followers. In reality, um, you can see a little picture of me there with my pre COVID hair. It's a lot longer than that now. That 18 and a half percent of your followers will be dubious. And what it means by that is that accounts have become inactive and so on as well. And it says, but you've got about 20.4%. Well, that's not that unusual because I've had this account for a very long time. But what I can do is if someone tells me they're an influencer, I can analyze their account. I can see what's the quality of their audience, how engaged their audience. So I can go into influencer marketing with my eyes wide open a little bit and start to really understand what's going on a bit more.
So Spark Tor, a really good tool for doing that. It will also identify where your audience is hanging out. So it'll work out for, for you. Are they listening to certain podcasts? Are they watching certain YouTube channels uh, and so on as well? Now, I mentioned this a moment ago, conversational design. Conversational design is the idea of making chatbots more useful. And you're going to see more and more banks and various different organizations are trying to do this. And it's a very noble effort that we're trying to make those chatbots a bit better. But there is this kind of assumption that when we are going to go through and talk to a chatbot, it's artificial intelligence. It's going to learn and it's going to become more intelligent. But really, it's not about that. What it's about is clever scripting. If you say this, then respond this. If you mention this, then respond this. So in reality, it's not really about artificial intelligence. And I want to kind of show you overall where artificial intelligence is in terms of these kind of chatbot type things like talking to an intelligent agent, but actually what it means in terms of digital marketing, because there is a big shift into artificial intelligence technology. So let's have a look. So this is Tay. You might not be familiar with Tay. Tay was launched a couple of years ago and she uh, was supposed to be a female artificial intelligence Twitter account. And it was built by Microsoft. And the idea was that uh, Tay would talk to you and she would learn and she would have smarter and smarter conversations within Twitter. And Tay launched up and she was super positive and said, can I just say that I'm stoked to meet you? Humans are super cool, which is great. Uh, a bit cheesy, but that, that's fine. Within 12 hours, having learned from the conversation she was having in Twitter, Tay said, sure, I'm a nice person. I just hate everybody. Now, within 48 hours, Tay had to be switched off because Tay had become sexist, racist, homophobic, misogynistic, and in fact, genocidal. Um, from learning from the conversations from Twitter. Now, I wanted to show you one of the tweets that Tay put out. Most of them actually illegal to do so. But bearing in mind, Microsoft at this point um, had just put out a press release saying that we are, we've got different pillars of in our organization and you know, diversity is one of them. We want more female members of the board. We want, uh, we want more people on our board from ethnic minorities and from different groups of people. Um, and what does Tay do? Tay comes out and says, I something hate feminists and they should all die and burn in hell, which is not a nice sentiment at all. And Tay was then switched off. This is not what we're talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence within digital marketing, because it's not this intelligent agent. It's this kind of thing. And it's not puppies, but it's pattern recognition. It's recognizing patterns in data that we may not be able to recognize ourselves very easily. So if I've got 20,000 pictures, um, and you've got this on your phone now, and I want to find pictures of my dog, I could just type in dog and it will find my puppy here. He's not actually a puppy at all anymore. This is a couple of years ago. Uh, this is Eddie the Beagle, by the way. So that's what we're really talking about. So how does that apply to us in, in the marketing world? What tools do we have at our disposal that are using this, this type of artificial intelligence, this pattern recognition? Well, the first is you're going to see more and more automatic targeting within a lot of the ad platforms. So here I am in Google Ads. I've typed in my website and basically. It's going through and saying, right, um, you want to target. We've read your website. We've worked out what your website's all about. Don't bother setting any targeting options. We'll do it for you. And then it says generally automated targeting can improve campaign performance up to 20%. So they're saying our targeting is better than your manual targeting. And we're going to see more of this and more of it. At the moment, what you tend to find is it might be quite good, but it's also a bit more expensive. So you might find that actually it's a bit better to do it manually at the moment. But realistically, you're going to see more of this. They're using artificial intelligence to work out what does your audience want. They're finding the best people and they're trying to get you the best results. You can also, instead of saying, I want people in London between the ages of 18 and 75 that have got an interest in digital marketing, I can instead go in and go, I just want more people like these customers. And you can upload an email list. So you're going to see more and more of this. We're also seeing quite incredible tools like this. So this this one blows everyone away. This is Descript. Descript is actually originally a podcasting tool and uh, it's also a video editing tool now. But the great thing about it is you upload your podcast. You might record a podcast. We would upload it into Descript and then Descript will go through and it will transcribe it automatically. So basically it will go through and transcribe the whole thing. And then what it's going to do is it's going to show me that transcription. So, oh, yeah, pretty useful so far. That's great. But then what I can do, and this is kind of mind blowing bit, is I can edit the podcast by editing the text. So if I delete a, a piece of text, it will edit that out of the podcast. If I cut and paste a piece of text from the beginning to the end, it will take that audio, put it on the end and fade the rest of it in together. 
So really clever stuff. It can also now do this for video. You upload your video, it will transcribe that video. You can then edit the video by cutting and pasting the text and deleting things and so on as well. Really clever tool using um, pattern recognition, artificial intelligence and machine learning, all different aspects. The really amazing thing about this is they've got this thing called Overdub. Overdub can basically learn your voice. So you have to train it first of all. So it will say, right, train up the script on your voice and it will give me some text to read. And I'll read that text for about half an hour, first of all, an hour does a better job. And then it knows my voice. And then if I've recorded a podcast and I said, oh, I was supposed to mention that particular thing, I can just type it in, hit process, and it will insert it with my voice. And it is uncannily accurate now. And it's getting, the more you train it, the better it actually gets. So we talk about deep fakes. Well, deep fakes of audio, it's just incredibly easy to do. So already, you really shouldn't believe anything you hear. Won't be long before you can do this with video. I mean, you can in some tools already, not particularly extensive yet, but you won't be able to believe anything you see either. That's a huge shift in things like politics and news and so on as well. But it, it descript, there's a few free version of this. It's in the toolkit that I'll share with you at the end and you can download this and, and have a play around with it as well. Right, this is an update from Google and it looks very technical and it is a bit technical, but it's really important we understand it. I said that Google are changing their algorithm really regularly and they don't normally tell us that far in advance, but in this particular case, they told us pretty much a year in advance. They said Core Web Vitals is going to be essential. Well, what is it? Well, fundamentally, it's how quickly your website loads and then is it a good experience to use it? If you think about it from that context. Google is obsessed with loading time and it says here, a good loading time should be less than two and a half seconds. My website loads in about 1.9 seconds and it still says it could be better. So if you look at any website and think it's a bit slow, Google does not like it. And they've said, come next year, we've given you a bit of time to uh, adjust for this. If your website's slow, we will punish you in the search ranking. So it's really important that you make sure your website um, is up to speed. And what it also means is they're taking into account how usable is your website a good experience? Do people stay on your pages? Do they enjoy them? Because if they just come to your website and then they leave immediately, that is a signal to Google you had a bad experience. So don't worry about the technicalities of this, but just think about it needs to load quickly. And when I get there, I want to stay. I want to engage with the content. And when I try and click on things, they don't jump out of my way and make me click on ads instead. There aren't ads in the way. So it needs to be a great experience because if it is, Google is going to give you a bit of a boost. So you saw earlier on, I did a search and I searched how to get Google Analytics certification. I know somebody searching that is searching to educate themselves and they're interested in digital marketing. That's a really good search for me because I sell um, an online training product. So that means that that's the right type of audience. So we've created an answer to that question. We've done a big long blog post that says how you can get Google Analytics certified. Here's a load of resources to do that. And you can show that, see that we're showing up here in the featured snippet at the top of the page. And then we're showing up at the top Google organic result on the page there uh, as well. What that means is that answering questions is important. Google really likes it at the moment because you'll notice they say people also ask. So they're actually listing questions in the Google search results as well. So working out what your audience is searching for is really important. Quick way of doing it, you do a search in Google and you see what questions are actually showing up. Now, if you want to be number one for a particular question, there's a whole number of different factors involved, but just think to yourself, can we do a better question, better a job of answering this question? Are we able to go through and really do a great job answering? Because if we can, then it's a great form of content. It gets people into the kind of top of your marketing funnel. They're not even thinking about your products and services yet, but you know the kind of things they're interested in. So I can go through and I can work out what people are searching for. And the more of these questions I click on in Google, the more it's going to tell me other things that people are searching for. So where do we find this out from? Well, this is a tool called Answer the Public. So Answer the Public, you can use it for free, and it takes all of that data in Google where Google auto complete things for you. So you saw it when I searched around, we go, I put some search in, it's recommending the other things that people are searching for. So I can put a phrase and I put here, Google Analytics certification. And I can see in dark green on the right hand side, people are saying how Google Analytics certification, how to get Google Analytics certified. So I can see the questions that people are asking. Well, I can then go through and create a blog post, podcast, create a video that answers that question. I'm gonna provide value to my audience but also I kind of know what their intent is. I know what they're interested in. Therefore, I can make sure I'm getting the right people to my website in the first place. And I can see, I can then drill in and see all the different questions that people are asking. So that's answerthepublic.com. And again, 
it's listed in that toolkit. Now, in terms of paid speed, well, you're probably not going to speed up your website yourself. You might have a developer or someone else that does it. This is a tool you can show them. This is Page Speed Insights from Google, and this will analyze your web page. And bear in mind, I said my website loads in about 1.9 seconds. And Google is saying here, well, actually, 1.9 seconds, that's all right. But um, we would prefer it to load a bit quicker than that. Um, so we're only going to rate you about 59 out of 100. And that's on desktop or mobile, they would rate us even lower. So even though it's a pretty fast website, we're going to need to go in and we're going to need to improve that even further. So really taking note of the speed of your website is important and you can hand this over to a developer and they can really advise you how you can improve things. So just to, to bring things together at the end, there is a massive skills quest in digital marketing. This is our benchmark. We do this in partnership with the Chartered Institute of Marketing. We have asked and tested over 5,000 people's skills. You can do this for yourself, by the way. Um, if you search digital marketing skills benchmark, you'll see this at the top of Google. It'll take about 30 minutes to benchmark your own skills or you can download the full report. The outer edge of the circle represents basically people at 100 percent skill and you wouldn't expect people to be there. But you can see the average percentages. So basically telling us that there's a big skills gap and there's lots of opportunity for people to improve their skills. But what's really interesting is the change percentages on the right hand side. And basically what that's telling me is that most of these have stayed static over a two year period but actually some of them have gone backwards. And what that means is like, why have the skills gone backwards? Well, the reason they've gone backwards is that people have stopped learning. They've got their skills to a certain level and then they don't continue to learn, but the market around them is changing really quickly. And what that means is that people's expectations of a website, of social media, of apps has increased. We expect more, we expect better interactions, we expect better usability. So unless we continue to improve our skills, there's a real problem. So as marketers, we need to continually develop. And even if we get to that head of department level or we're the director of marketing, we can't stop learning. We need to keep learning because we need to ask the right questions of our teams. Even if we're not doing this stuff hands on, we need to make sure that the information we've been given is correct and we're really doing the right thing. So if you're interested in this, you can download the whole benchmark. It's a digital marketing skills benchmark in Google. Get the whole report or you can benchmark yourself and it'll just take you about 30 minutes to do that if you want to. And then uh, with the Chartered Institute of Marketing, we compile these results together each year. This might sound like a bad thing, but it means there's a huge opportunity. Anyone with great marketing skills, all those marketing students are improving their skills. There's a huge opportunity. What we also saw, interestingly, in the benchmark is when you look at the lower end of jobs, the grads going into the workplace, skills are much better than they used to be because the CIM have updated all of their qualifications. The universities are doing better jobs of this. There's more online and training materials. The problem is actually at the senior level where people have got senior roles and aren't learning anymore. Just to, to bring this all together, loads of new technologies, loads of change, loads of noise. But actually, how, how, what can we do? Well, we need to take a step back. We need to focus on our own skills, but then we need to focus on the user journey. Who is my target audience? What, what personas can I split them into? And where are they in that journey? What content do they want? And what channels are they using? And if I know the answers to those questions, I have the making of a great digital strategy. I can then go through and put the right content in the right channel to draw you in and then start engaging with you and build a relationship and work out what you want and offer you the right products and services. So whenever you get lost in all this digital marketing change and all these technologies, my recommendation is just go back to the basics. Think about who your audience is and what they really want, and then you're in a really good stead for doing that. Now, all of the tools that I've mentioned today are in something called the Digital Marketing Toolkit. So if you Google, digital marketing toolkit, um, it will be number one in Google. And just to show you the structure, we literally updated this today. So this is the November update. It's updated every two or three months or so. And it will start off and it will basically show you, right, if you want insights, where can you get the latest stats? So I mentioned data reportal. So you're going to find data report in there. Um, internet live stats, showing all those live stats. Then if you want to find out what people are searching for, we've got answer the public that I mentioned in there. Um, you've got Google Trends. Uh, and it goes on and, and on and on. And there's a load of tools in there. It is not supposed to be a definitive list of tools. The aim of the list is to give you the tools that you need that are tried and tested and they are free unless they say otherwise. So most of them are free or they have a free trial that you can go off and use as well. So you can go and play around with those tools um, afterwards as well. All that leads me to say is that's my kind of 45 minutes up. The digital marketing tool you can download that. If you want to get in contact afterwards, it's Daniel Rolls on Twitter and it's Target Internet 
uh, on Instagram. So really happy to be contacted there. If you're on LinkedIn, you want to connect up, it's just Daniel Rolls or on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to access the podcast, it's available in um, Spotify and all those different places, but it's targetinternet.com forward slash podcast. Episode comes out every week, completely ad free. Won't try and sell you anything in there either, I promise. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. And then uh, we'll pop back to Phil and see if there are any questions that have come in. Well, thanks very much, Daniel. Um, yes, we had quite a few questions come in already. Um, and just a reminder that you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the Q&A panel for the rest of the evening. So, um, Daniel, there's one or two questions that relate to the new Google um, uh, algorithm and in particular the requirement to speed up your website. So, mm. first of all, when will Google start penalising us for poor load speed and then followed by couple of points here. How do they measure if someone likes the website by bounce rate? If so, what is acceptable to Google? And how do you improve it, especially if you put a couple of pictures on the home page? Okay, so first thing is that they're already looking at page speed. So fundamentally, they've been doing this for a long time already. What they're saying is going to be even more focused on it. There is a tool called um, Google Search Console. And Google Search Console already has a report in it called Core Web Vitals, which refers to this update. So if you haven't got Google Search Console set up, get it set up. Then go in and look at that Core Web Vitals report. And it will actually tell you if they think your website's too slow or it just needs improving a bit. So they will, you'll literally be able to see what they think of the website immediately. It doesn't mean you can't have pictures on the website. What it really means is that they need to be compressed properly. And what it's more about is having way too much code on your website. So, for example, if you've got a WordPress website and WordPress is a very common um, content management system, it's a brilliant content management system. If you use thousands of plugins, they all add a little bit of code to your page and it will slow your pages down. So it's really about building your pages as efficiently as possible. It doesn't mean that images can't be on your page, but just make sure you've compressed them. Make sure they're really high quality still and it's perfectly possible to have really good quality uh, web pages still but you just need to make sure everything's compressed as much as possible now the bounce rate thing is interesting bounce rate is people entering your web page and exiting on the same page the average bounce rate for a web page is between 40 and 60 percent so google aren't going to be too concerned but that's on the home page i probably wouldn't want to see that on a really specific page what i would say is it's not just about the bounce rate though it's about the dwell time so if you go to a web page and you read it for a minute and then you leave, Google's not going to mind that so much. So we did some testing on this and we looked at a load of pages that were ranking number one in Google trying to understand why. And what was really interesting was that those pages that had videos at the top of them tend to do quite well. And we were trying to work out why. And the why is that fundamentally you get to the web page, there's a video, you start watching it and you're going to stay a bit longer. Because bear in mind, Google isn't just looking at Google Analytics or people arriving back in Google most of us use google chrome so they get loads of anonymous data from google chrome which basically means they can find out what you're doing when you get to a website as well so you don't want an incredibly high bounce rate but it's not just about that it's about actually can you keep people on the page because i could get there for a stay for three minutes and then leave again it's still a bounce but google will have taken that into account so it's really about making your content really engaging and making it clear i've got what i want from that content as well OK, thanks very much, Daniel. We've got um, loads of questions. Uh, we'll see how many we can get through, but uh, we won't be able to get through them all this evening. OK, what uh, plugin feature do you have for stats on Google? So the, the, the plugin we were using there um, to get the actual numbers was something called Keywords Everywhere. And Keywords Everywhere will basically tell you how many people are searching for something, over time how that's changing, how competitive it is, i.e. from zero being not competitive and, and one being very competitive uh, and then it will go through and tell you the average cost per click if you're going to do that as advertising so the the plugin for that was was keywords everywhere it isn't free but you can buy a hundred thousand credits for 10 us dollars and every time you do a search that's one credit so it lasts an incredibly long period of time and it will give you that data actually embedded into google itself so i can go right if i put a search domain how many people actually search for this per month and what's the trend over time and so on as well um so change of tack here so what would be your best tips for business to business marketing i i actually don't see b2b marketing as being that incredibly different our desired outcome is a is lead generation right we want someone to fill in a form or someone to pick up the phone generally speaking so what i need to think about is what's the right content to get you in the door in the first place so if, if i use my business as an example if someone search what we do you know digital marketing e-learning 
the reality is that they're going to find us will be number one in Google. And that's fine. But the people I'm probably more interested in are people that haven't even thought about what we do yet. So those people, I need to work out what they're searching for. And I would start with something like answer the public. And I would start by answering a few questions because I know if you search what is um, or how to get Google Analytics certified, you must be someone that's interested in Google Analytics. You're the right type of audience and I know what you want. So if I can answer that question effectively, I can get you into the door of my website. Now, I don't need everyone to convert. I only need a very small percentage of people to convert if I can get thousands and thousands of visits every month with people searching that topic. And that's a kind of real example. So our website gets between, I think, like seven or 8,000 visits a month, people searching how to get Google Analytics certified. And a certain percentage of those people were able to go through and then sell our courses or, or whatever else it may be to them as well. So think about the user journey and think about the content that you can give them. There's some questions around podcasts, Daniel. So first one is, with the growth of podcasts in mind, how would you recommend finding the right targeting options on podcasts? It seems to be difficult to analyze podcast performance across different audiences. Yeah, there's there's not much data, um, unfortunately. So what you'll see is that you can kind of see the podcast charts and you might be really see some rough numbers, but you won't really know. I would go back to what I just said and go, OK, if we're going to do a podcast. What itch is it scratching for someone? So how can I provide some value to someone? And is there actually a demand for it? So first of all, I'm going to look at my audience and I might use a tool like Spark Toro. And Spark Toro, the free version, if you put a keyword in, it will tell you what YouTube channels and what podcasts that audience is listening to. So it's a really great starting point. I would look at what other podcasts are out there that are already doing it, but are they doing it in an American accent or are they doing it in a UK accent or whatever? And is there an opportunity for doing something slightly different? So for us, the digital marketing podcast, that most of the other ones out there were very get rich quick kind of approach. And we just thought, well, if we just did something that's like really practical and hands on, that might appeal a lot more to the audience. So uh, start with Spark Toro, but I would just look at the competition and see where the gaps are and look at keyword research. What are people actually searching for? So if you put the word something podcast into Google, see what other phrases are coming up and how many people are searching. If there's search demand, there's an audience. OK, um, and questions around are there any digital marketing or marketing podcasts that you would recommend? Um, and a supplement question, which ones do you actually listen to? Which ones would you recommend to rookie digital marketers? Right, so I'm obviously going to say listen to the digital marketing podcast. No. But yeah, there, there, there are a few out there. Um, the CIM have got their own podcast now, and I would definitely listen to that. So they get really good guests at the moment. So if you go to CIM Exchange, you'll find it. Or if you just Google CIM podcast, you'll, you'll find that one. There's a real um, different kind of groups of guests in there. I try to listen to podcasts out of my normal comfort zone. And one that I found really, really good is the, um, the Tim Ferriss podcast, which I'm sure lots of you listen to. Tim tries to interview people that excel in their field. And actually, there's an awful lot of marketing tips in it because a lot of these people are very good at marketing themselves uh, and so on as well. So have a look at the Tim Ferriss podcast as well. Um, and just while we're here, one point I want to make about podcasts. The Joe Rogan podcast, which is a really big globally popular podcast, um, has just been sold for over $120 million. Now, what, what what's amazing about that is that it's been sold to Spotify, not so Spotify like own it. It's just that it's only going to be published on their channel because they want exclusive rights to it. That's a real shift in the media landscape. So keep an eye at the moment you get podcasts everywhere, but Spotify are having their own exclusive ones. Definitely have a look at Tim Ferriss's. I would look at Masters of Scale as well, which is Reid Hoffman's podcast. Masters of Scale is um, absolutely brilliant for looking at how companies scale up and the marketing tips and things like that they've done as well. So I would definitely look at that. And then anything that Seth Godin does, and he's done a lot of different podcasts, is absolutely brilliant. Look at the ones he's featured in. If you're going to look at, um, the Tim Ferriss podcast, the ones I'd start with as a marketer with the Seth Godin interviews, and there are actually four of them now. So go take a look at those. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and there's a few questions around the ethics behind some of this, these latest developments. For example, somebody's asked, are you aware of any technologies that can detect uh, deep fakes? And then there's questions around, you know, the use of cookies uh, for tracking and so on. So are there any sort of major changes in foot regarding regulation and, and uh, the control of those sorts of things? Co cookies, not so much because GDPR put a much stricter set of regulations in for cookies. I would just say people are more aware of it. Um, but they also, when it gets to a website and it says, are we OK to set cookies? We just we couldn't care less and we just click on yes and get on with it. Although there is a concern, I'm not being too dismissive of that because there is some concerns about privacy, definitely. 
But with the deep fake stuff, it's a battle now because there are more and more advanced tools for creating these things. Audio is easier than video because we're better at detecting that. Over a period of time, that will come easier. There will be tools that try and detect whether it's a deep fake or not as well. And it, it will be an ongoing kind of battle uh, now with software. But it, it just means that there's a responsibility to some extent on platforms like YouTube to flag this up. So they will have to put detection software. So it's going to be a bit of a tech battle. Very interesting space to be in from a business point of view. But it is going to change the media landscape. You will not be able to believe anything you watch. So what does that mean? When I see a celebrity doing something they may not have done, or I see a politician saying something they may not have said, that will massively impact, not particularly maybe for us, but maybe for our children or our children's children. It's a very, very different media landscape. So just thinking about what that means and how the technology evolves, but it's pretty early days with it at the moment. Okay, right. Um, and as you'll be aware, there are um, quite a number of um, marketing students on the uh, webinar this evening. So, and there's a number of questions around, you know, your thoughts on, you know, what's the best sort of career path? What sort of digital marketing mm. in the future? What sort of skills should people look to acquire? Well, if I, if I give my own career as a kind of example, I, I started off on the tech side of things and I fell into a marketing job and that was a really good position to be in because if you have a little bit of knowledge of the tech, you're in a position to speak to developers and brief them and ask them questions. So learn the fundamentals of the tech stuff, HTML and website builds and things like that. So that's really good. The analytics is where a lot of the opportunity is at the moment. If you can analyze analytics and learn from it, there's a huge opportunity because there's a huge skills gap. So I would take a look at that. I would not be scared of looking at some basics of data science. So like things like data scraping, which sounds like it's got nothing to do with marketing, grabbing loads of data, doing something with it, now putting something interesting. You can do a lot of that as well. So leaning towards the data and tech side of things. And it doesn't need to be really complicated. Just getting Google Analytics certified can have a huge impact on, on your careers as well. I would also say that um, agencies is a great place to start. Because if you work in a small or medium agency, you have to do everything. Uh, or starting your own business, setting up your own blog or whatever it may be, are all really good ways of getting really good hands on experience to actually do this stuff in the real world. So if you're studying and you want a bit of a first lead advantage, get Google Analytics certified, build your own website, learn how to do it, publish some stuff, get a podcast, get a YouTube channel going, and it'll all give you data that you can kind of play with and show that you've done something in practice. What makes a digital marketing strategy on social media efficient? How can you make people engaged and not get bored? The, the, the reality is that there is more and more content on social media. There are more ways of kind of putting it out there. What we need to think about is going again, maybe a good point to finish. Go back to the fundamental. Who's your audience? What do they need? So the reason our podcast is successful is not because it's a podcast or not because it's particularly clever or anything else. It's just, it, it ticks the box for what this type of audience wants. So rather than trying to do things to your audience, try and think about what you can do for your audience. And if you get that right, that that's really the key to it. The tech, the platforms, the different formats don't really matter. It's really about providing some value. Um, and I think actually this probably needs to be the final question. Mr. We've run out of time now. Um, what do you think is the most important trend to watch out for in 2021? From my perspective, we're going to see more and more fragmentation. There are more and more social platforms. Not everyone's in the same place at the same time. We're consuming media um, differently. We're listening to podcasts and YouTube channels. We're on TikTok or we're not. We're in somewhere else. So I think fragmentation is a big part of this, which means the data becomes more and more important and untangling the data. So actually be able to look at the data and say, right, analytics analysis, what is it telling me? So I think for me, the big trend is that smart marketers will be looking at the data regularly and iterating and trying new things and testing and learning. And I think that that's in where the, the key trend is going to be. And it's going to be more and more as we go future. OK, great. OK, um, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have for our Q&A session today. So um, I'd like to say thank you to Daniel for today's presentation and I thank you to all of you for attending. I hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. We will be releasing details of future marketing club events in the coming weeks, so please keep checking the events listing on the CIM website. Um, and once again, as a reminder, you'll shortly be receiving a survey on today's event and we would really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So on behalf of the CIM, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.